talk about osmosis being the movement, the passive movement of water, and passive meaning that it's not requiring energy, it's a downhill movement, it is happening according to or along the concentration gradient. Um, it's going to always be passive, but it's going to also be unaffected by the membrane potential. Now, why do we think this is unaffected by the membrane potential? Why do you think this is unaffected by the membrane potential? Sorry? I think I'm... All right, so it's, it's permeable to the solutes, yes, but in terms of water movement, why does water movement happen irrespective of whether the cell is negative inside, whether it's at rest, excited? Right, that's specifically for charged particles, right? The electrical driving force has to do with the charge on the particle. And so water sort of escapes that, and it's under its own influence, which is this force we're talking about, osmosis. So that's unaffected by the membrane potential or by whether the cell is negative or positive on the inside. Uh, and it's driven purely by the gradient of water, so purely by the concentration gradient. And so in this first image up here, we can see that inside the cell, we have solutes. Outside the cell, we don't. And so the direction water will move is from the area of high water concentration or low solute concentration, you can look at it that way, to an area of low water concentration, which happens to be high solute concentration, okay? And then alternatively, we see another scenario here where we have a higher solute concentration. So there are more, particles dissolve in the solution outside the cell than there are inside the cell. Okay, we can see that by the difference in the milliosmoles here, right? much more particles associated here. And so the force that is moving the water here is going from high, again, high concentration inside to lower concentration outside where we have more particles. Okay, so very straightforward. The movement of water according to its concentration gradient. Let's look at the osmolarity. <laughs> Now, osmolarity is a reflection of the total particles that are dissolved or dispersed in a solution, okay? And osmolarity is usually taking into account all the particles that have been further dissociated. So when you speak about osmolarity, we usually use the mole versus the osmo. And the mole is really the particles that we start with. It's the particles that are then dissociated into the water. So if you look at this scenario, we have two alternative, uh, two different molecules here. Um, we have glucose and we have sodium chloride. Now, if we have 0.1 mole of glucose, that's the particles we're starting with before it's been dissociated in water, and we disperse that in one liter of water, the overall osmolarity of that solution is going to be 0.1 osmo, right? But if we take another type of solute, if we take sodium chloride, we also disperse that in that same amount of water, one liter, the osmolality of that solution changes. It's now 0.2 osmos. And that's because sodium chloride further dissociates into two different particles, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. In water, right? So when that sodium chloride, it's one particle to speak, so to speak, uh, as, as we start, but then it further dissociates into two separate particles once it's in that one liter of water. And so our osmolarity is going to look different because osmolarity is taking the total solute concentration, the total number of particles that have been dispersed in the water. And so the moles will look different from the osmoles. Okay? Two solutions or two molecules or solutes can have the same moles and have a different osmolarity in that solution. Um, usually in body composition, we talk about the milliosmo, right? So when you look at body fluids, the osmolarity of body fluids does not typically exceed one osmo. And so we talk about the uh, milliosmo, which is one thousandth of a single osmo when we look at body fluid composition and body fluid osmolarity. And we'll look at some examples today where you'll see that. Um, and so when you look at the ICF and the ECF, right, both of those cellular environments should have an osmolarity of about 280 uh, to about 300 milliosmoles, okay? And that just tells us, all this tells us is how about how many particles are dissolved or dissociated in our intracellular fluid and in our extracellular fluid. And as we'll see when we look at uh, some scenarios here in a minute, they should be the same. So the ICF and the ECF should have the same osmolarity. Otherwise, we can get into some difficulty and then some pathology and uh, other complications can arise. So that's typically 280 to 300 uh, milliosmoles. 
All right, let's look at some scenarios here with osmolarity. Let's look at some different solutions or different types of um, solutions. So in the middle here, we have what our body should typically be looking like. The intracellular environment and the extracellular environment <clears throat> should have the same osmolarity. And as a result, there should be no uh, net accumulation of water on either side. There will still be movement of water because we have movement of water in and out of our cells all the time, but no net accumulation either inside the cell or on the outside of the cell. If we uh, expose one of our eukaryotic cells to a hyperosmotic solution, what we'll see is that now there's a uh, force, we talked about this force, where water wants to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. And because the osmolarity of the solution is now higher than the uh, inside the cell, water's gonna move outside the cell. And what do you think is gonna happen physically to this cell? It's gonna shrink, it's gonna shrink until it eventually shrivels and then you have cell lysis or cell death, okay? On the other hand, we have a hypoosmotic solution. And again, just to remind ourselves, when we say hypoosmotic, it means it has less solute concentration than the cell, right? So the cell has more particles than the water out here. So the water is more diluted compared to the cell. And so water wants to move from a high concentration outside to a lower concentration. Again, we're looking at the gradient of water. And so water moves into this cell and that eventually causes the cell to swell until it bursts or rupture or lysis, right? Lysis. Okay, and so this is what happens if we expose ourselves to either a hyperosmotic, meaning it's too salty, so to speak, or a hypoosmotic, meaning that it's not salty enough, right? It's too watery or too diluted, and we can have these varying types of pathology. And what this can look like clinically is if you think about water intoxication, so if you drink too much water, physically that can become uh, problematic. You can have vomiting, you can go into a coma, that excess water can be detrimental to cells. Right? And the alternative is true. If you go through severe dehydration, the, that, ex that, um, that excess uh, hyperosmotic environment, so that salty environment around the cell can be detrimental to the cells as well. Right? All that water will rush into the cell, it'll swell, and it will rupture. And that can become um, pathological. Let's talk about the osmotic pressure. So the osmotic pressure is a force right? And it's a reflection of the force that's created on the solutes that are in that concentration or that's in that solution, okay? So the way that I like to explain this is if we think about, so far we've been looking at our water gradient and the movement of water, but you can almost think of this as the solutes pulling water to them, right? We know that water is moving along its concentration gradient, right? There's more water on this side, and that's reflected by a lower osmolarity, right? Less particles. There's less water on this side, also reflected by a higher osmolarity, more particles. And so water is going to move from this side to this side. But the way that we can express this, the way that we can think of this is as the solute having a pull effect or a pulling force on the water that is on this side. And so we call that pull effect or that pull force the osmotic pressure, okay, the osmotic pressure. It's the ability of solutes to pull water to them based upon that difference in solute concentration. We can also think of it as the pressure that would be required to stop the movement of that water, right? A force that would be required to stop that flow of water. When we speak about osmotic pressure, we typically use, um, we can use millimeters of mercury or we can use the atmospheres to represent uh, the osmotic pressure. And what we see here is that on this side, we have an osmotic pressure of 7.4 atmospheres. On this side, we have a higher osmotic pressure of 12.3 atmospheres. And, so, and so if you look at the osmotic pressure gradient, the osmotic pressure is higher on side two and lower on side one. All right, so that's the gradient of the osmotic pressure. But the movement of water is always opposite the osmotic gradient, okay? The movement of water is always opposite the osmotic gradient. Let's explain what that means here a little bit. So water is moving from side one to side two, and the 
area that has the higher osmotic pressure is really the side that's doing the pulling. So this has our 12.3 atmospheres, more solute concentration. And so those particles have an overpowering force that's bringing the water from side one to side two. Okay, so the take home message there is that the osmotic pressure gradient, the movement of water happens opposite the direction of that gradient. Let's move on to speak about tonicity. Now tonicity is uh, also similar to osmolarity, but when we look at the tonicity of a cell, we typically talk about the impermeant solutes. So the impermeant solutes really means the particles that cannot move across that membrane. Okay, the particles that cannot move across that membrane. And so very similar to what we saw with osm osmolarity is that an isotonic solution has a similar environment as the cell, right? So that's if you place a cell in a solution that looks very similar to uh, the osmolarity of the cell. A hypertonic solution has a higher osmolarity and then a hypotonic solution has a lower osmolarity. And so let's look at an example to really differentiate the difference between tonicity and osmolarity. All right, tonicity and osmolarity. We said osmolarity is the total solute concentration. We're looking at all the particles that are dispersed or displaced in the solution. With tonicity, we're only looking at the particles that cannot move. And so if you compare these two cells or compare these two scenarios, we'll see that a solution can be isoosmotic, as it is on the left, but not isotonic, right? As it is on, as it's not on the right, okay? And so on the left, we see that we have two particles in question here. We have one that's impermeant, right? Particle X, let's call it, in purple. And then urea is the second particle in yellow. Now, urea can freely move across the membrane. So when we speak about osmolarity, we're going to be looking at the, all the particles that are dispersed. We're looking at urea along with particle X, this purple um, solute. And so what we'll see is that the urea concentration is 300 milliosmoles whereas the concentration inside the cell is also 300 milliosmoles. And so we have an isoosmotic situation here. The, the osmolarity is looking at all the particles that are dispersed. The tonicity only takes into account the particles that cannot move. So on this, uh, on this scenario, we're not taking into account urea at all. We can absolutely ignore urea because urea can freely move across this membrane. And so we're only looking at the solutes that are impermeant. Impermeant meaning they cannot go through the membrane. And so when we take away urea, where is the higher solute concentration? Just pretend that you can blank out all the yellow. Where's the higher solute concentration? It's inside, right? If you completely ignore all the yellow, the higher solute concentration is inside, isn't it? Right, and so the higher water concentration would be where? Outside, right? We have higher solute inside. Remember, we're ignoring the yellow because the yellow is an impermeant solute, right? It's, it's a permeable solute. We're only taking into account impermeant solutes, so only the solute in purple. And so what we have is a water gradient from high concentration to low concentration because we have solutes in here and essentially we have no solutes outside, right? And so the solution here is hypotonic, although that very same solution, if you look at its osmolarity, it's isoosmotic, but if you look at its tonicity, it's hypotonic, right? And this is really how we differentiate or sort of um, are able to uh, distinguish between osmolarity and tonicity. Tonicity is really the effect that those particles are bringing about on the movement of water. Osmolarity is purely all the solutes that are dissolved in that, uh, that solution, right? So all these solute particles are being taken into account with osmolarity and with tonicity, not so much, okay? Um, this table kind of summarizes those differences, uh, the difference in concentration, um, and so I'll advise you guys to sort of go over it, make sure you can understand that here we're looking at all the particles, permeant and impermeant. Here we're only looking at impermeant. Um, and just make sure that you understand and you're able to differentiate tonicity and, uh, and osmolarity.
Okay. All right, so let's wrap up by looking at this final slide. And this is really uh, just looking at those two examples of water movement again. So just making sure we understand why water moves in the direction that it does with regard to this differing solute concentration. So in this first, in this top scenario here, A, we have a higher solute concentration inside the cell. And so that's 300 milliosmoles there. And um, a lower solute concentration in the solution outside the cell, right? 150 osmoles. So we have half the particles dissolved in the solution outside. And so what happens is, where does the water move in that first scenario? Where does the water move? Where's our water gradient? Is it into or out of the cell? Into the cell, into the cell, right? Higher water concentration outside, lower water concentration inside, water moves into the cell. And so we can see this cell is eventually going to start swelling because water is moving into it. And when is the water movement gonna stop? It's gonna stop when we now have equilibrium. The amount of particles dissolved has sort of equalized without actually moving the particles. We've moved water and that has equalized both of the solutions, okay? So the osmolarity of both of the solutions are the same because water moved into the cell to equalize those solutions. All right, let's look at the second uh, scenario here. So we have a high co solute concentration outside the cell and a lower solute concentration inside the cell. So half the particles that are outside the cell are dispersed or half the number of particles dispersed outside are dispersed inside the cell. And so where's water gonna wanna move in this scenario? It's gonna be going outside, perfect. So because we have this water gradient, water's high concentration in here, water's at a lower concentration outside, water moves out of the cell, and the movement will stop when we get to equilibrium, when we've moved enough water outside of the cell so that we equalize the overall osmolarity of both of these solutions, okay? So the osmolarity of both solutions will now be 600 once we've moved water out of the cell. And we can see that the cell has visibly shrunken, okay? The cell has visibly shrunken. This is why it's very important for us to have an equal intracellular osmolarity as our extracellular osmolarity. We don't want water to be moving excessively in and out of our cells, right? We don't want water to be accumulating, right, inside or outside of our cells. We want that movement to be in equilibrium and so that the osmolarities are, are the 